In this video, I'm going to talk about wireless network security. Uh, we're going to talk about the various types of wireless networks there are, and then some of the security issues that you might see along with them, and then ultimately how we can help improve the security of these in the future. So let's jump right in with that, and let's talk about some various types of wireless networks. Uh, we'll talk about these first two right here, uh, NFC and RFID. They're fairly similar. They're not, but we can talk about them as, as well. They're fairly similar. Uh, but NFC, RFID, this is the type of, of information that you would see, uh, like when you go to the store and you go to buy something, uh, and it's something expensive, so they have to run it across a special pad on the register to help the alarms from going off when you leave the store. Uh, that particularly is called RFID, or Radio Frequency ID. And what it is, is it basically it's just a little loop of wire uh, with a little a little computer chip attached to it. And when it walks next to a sensor, the sensor powers it, and then it sends out some sort of an ID or some bit of information. So that's used for both loss prevention in stores as well as several other items uh, on a day-to-day -day basis that you may not even know that you have. Uh, the most common that you would see in business environments would be a door badge. Uh, you might have a door badge, just a, a badge, a little notch up at the top, has your picture on it. And what you do is you hold it up next to the door and the door automatically unlocks. Uh, and that uses a type of RFID in order to help identify who you are so you can then go through the door. Additionally, they have something similar on some credit cards uh, for contactless payment. Uh, it, it, I've actually seen that this is, is kind of going away, um, not as popular as it used to be, but there used to be the idea of you just uh, wave your credit card over top of a little machine. The machine says, oh yeah, okay, I know who you are. I'm going to go ahead and bill you. Uh, so it's a contactless payment method. Uh, however, these guys are kind of problematic. Uh, the fact that it just runs over radio frequency, especially the fact that it's able to, uh, for instance, with contact payment, the fact that it's able to charge things against you wirelessly allows them to be easily exploited. Uh, in the case of this badge or a credit card right here, I could just have some sort of a sensor that sends out a signal to these to these devices that says, hey, I, I want to authenticate you. I want to know who you are. Uh, so when it sends out the signal, the badge or the credit card then sends back its information. And then that sensor could be hooked up to a computer that I capture the information on. Now that I have the information, I can then embed that into some other device, either another credit card or just onto a uh, credit card-like device that is powered by my computer. And then I can go and I can purchase things. I can open doors. I could do pretty much anything that those NFC or RFID tags could do previously. So a uh, great wireless network option. Uh, however, full of a lot of security holes. Ah. Uh, the next one here, infrared, you don't see this very much anymore, uh, but it used to be that on the side of laptops, uh, like back in the days before Wi-Fi really started becoming popular, uh, there would be a little infrared port. Uh, and then even a lot of cell phones would have infrared ports on them so that you can then pair up your cell phone with your uh, laptop. And this helped to exchange information and, and some applications back and forth. It's not used as often, uh, one, because it has very limited range, uh, two, because they, the devices literally have to be pointing right at each other for it to really work in many situations. Uh, the next item is Bluetooth. Now, we all have Bluetooth in our phones nowadays. Uh, I don't think you can actually even buy a phone that doesn't support Bluetooth. Uh, initially, it was for... Uh, for headsets to, to be able to plug into them. Uh, but now it's so that your watch can plug into it, so your car connect to it, uh, it's so that your wireless speakers can connect to it, uh, and then so that you can share information between various people in your organization or in your friends. You can share contact information. Uh, it turns out that there's the fact that this system is just open uh, a lot of the time. It was open to a lot of attacks. Uh, there were a couple of them called Blue say blue jacking and blue snarfing. 
that were fairly popular. Uh, bluejacking, if I remember correctly, would actually connect up to your device and try to send messages, such as emails or various information to your phone. Uh, and then blue snarfing was more gathering the information off of your phone. I may be incorrect on that actual categorization. Uh, but the idea was that, uh, again, because Bluetooth, similar to RFID and NFC, because they were fairly limited in their range, uh, there wasn't a whole lot of security enforced around them, and therefore anybody could connect up to them. Bluetooth is starting to become much more popular because no longer is it simply a like a five meter range. It's now a hundred meter range or 200 meter range i forget exactly what it is uh, but it's now quite large uh, and so the security features built into bluetooth are becoming more and more important as the days go on interestingly enough and i'm not sure about the validity of this but i've actually heard of city planners using bluetooth in their stoplights uh, what would happen is you would have a stoplight uh, with an rfid reader on it and so when a car shows up horrible horrible car um the rfid on your in your car would send a signal out and the stoplight would read that you were there when it gets when your car then gets to the next stoplight it then picks up your rfid to be able to identify how fast you're traveling and hopefully synchronize the lights so that you are able to travel quickly and efficiently from one stoplight through the next so you don't have to stop at every single one I don't know if that's necessarily true, but it does raise the concern of people are able to track me through my Bluetooth at, at that point. And really the only answer to have that, uh, to resolve that is to turn it off. Uh, I'm going to skip Wi-Fi just right now because Wi-Fi is actually such a large section. I have a couple of other slides specifically talking about that. And honestly, that's the one you really care about. Uh, that's that's why you're watching this. Uh, there were a couple other options here. See, microwave. You may not necessarily see a whole lot of microwave in your day-to-day -day use as far as a consumer, uh, but businesses still use microwave radio transmissions quite a bit. Uh, one very key example of this might be if you have two different buildings uh, that are separated and for some reason you can't run a wire between the two. Uh, maybe there's a parking lot in between the two and you need to communicate between the two buildings, but you can't tear up the parking lot to lay down a new wire. Uh, so what they would do is they would just set up an antenna on both of these and they would point them to each other and then you would be able to communicate over a microwave transmission between the, very, between the two buildings. At that point, it's really considered a point-to-point -point connection. It is fairly secure because uh, in order to listen in, listen into a, wire, a microwave wireless communication, you would have to be kind of right here in the middle in order to pick up the signal. Not saying it's not possible, but it would be a little difficult. Uh, plus, hopefully at that point, the security engineers are using more secure protocols. They're maybe doing a VPN between the two buildings uh, to help improve the overall microwave security. Uh, and then lastly on the list here, cellular. Well, cellular has actually become more and more popular as bandwidths have increased and popularity of cell phones and tablets and other devices have come on out there. Uh, and even now, uh, a lot of people will connect their laptops up to their cell phones in order to get internet access on their laptops uh, when they're not around any other access points. Uh, 4G, you know, 3G, 4G, and now 5G uh, coming out, they're fairly secure, not so much as far as the data that's being transmitted across them, but separating one user from another is has been proven to be fairly secure. Not, in, not fully, however. Um, there have been situations of, say, police officers uh, utilizing the cellular signals in order to help track where people are. Uh, so similar to what we did with when we were talking up here with the Bluetooth, where people were able to be tracked based on their Bluetooth IDs, uh, same thing can happen with cellular signals to where you can be tracked based on where your cellular phone is. And really all it is is you just put up an antenna and you start listening to the cellular signals that are out there.
So lots of different wireless options out there. Um, some are more secure than others. Really, it's just a matter of identifying which technology you want to use and identifying the best way to be secure about it. All right, so Wi-Fi, uh, wireless uh, networks, that's probably the main reason why we're all here. So there are a lot of vulnerabilities built into Wi-Fi, and really a, a lot of it comes down to the fact that, well, Wi-Fi was created before a whole lot of security was really thought of, and be, and the, the processors at the time just weren't really all that capable. So even though Wi-Fi is being used today, they were still based off of technology that was invented 15, 20 years ago. Uh, so some of the more common Wi-Fi vulnerabilities, well, the first off is that you're remotely accessing a network, uh, which means you can access it both inside the building and most likely outside of a building. Uh, I used to work at, a, at an organization where we had Wi-Fi set up and we had some really nice tools to it to where we would see where our access points are and then it would also show us where all of our users were. And it was really helpful to be able to see where people were uh, when they were using their phones or using their, their laptops or other wireless devices so we knew where the access points needed to be strongest. Well, one day I noticed we had an, act, uh, an active user that was outside of the building. It was somebody in our parking lot. It turned out to be a valid user. Uh, they, they were actually an employee. They were just simply on lunch, eating and using their laptop for something. Uh, but they were out in the parking lot and it was, it was remote from the building. Obviously a vulnerability to the environment. Oh. Uh, along with Wi-Fi, with Wi-Fi, there's so many options that you can choose with Wi-Fi. Uh, for instance, you could choose to have no encryption whatsoever on your wireless access points. Uh, obviously, with no encryption, that means anybody can listen to what's going on. Because this is going through the air, that means anybody with a wi another wireless device could listen into your conversation because it's not being encrypted. So uh, that's the equivalent of having a conversation in public and anybody around you, whether you're on the bus or, or just standing on the street corner, anybody who's near you would be able to listen to what you're saying and understand what's going on. Uh, the second option was web encryption. Uh, when wireless access points first started coming out, uh, we utilized what was called WEP or wired equivalency, wired equivalency protection privacy, something like that. Uh, and the idea was that if we were encrypting your data uh, that was being transmitted through the air. At the time, this was pretty much the best that could be available just due to the overall processing power of all the network devices at the time. Uh, however, now it's considered very, very much a weak encryption. It's very easy to crack. Uh, it's so much that you could actually crack most web packets and most web transactions uh, within like 10 or 15 seconds nowadays. Uh, the next item, uh, WPS or WPA, uh, were kind of replacements of WEP encryption. Uh, however, these utilize what's called a shared key. In fact, WEP utilized a shared key as well. Uh, shared keys, basically you have a password that you set up and you share that around to everybody who needs to access your Wi-Fi. Because everybody uses the same shared key, then that means that as soon as that shared key is compromised, as soon as it's found out by somebody, suddenly they know the keys for everything. Uh, there are a couple of ways to help fix this. You could change the shared keys on a regular basis, but if you have hundreds or thousands of network devices, that means you have to change the key on hundreds or thousands of different devices on a routine basis. Uh, additionally, you could have different keys available for different locations or different access points, uh, but then this complicates things of, well, why can I access things over here on, on the west side of the building, but I can't access things on the east side of the building because they have different keys, uh, but that doesn't make sense to the end user. Uh, let's see, also Wi-Fi eavesdropping. Ooh. That probably is pretty obvious at this point. Uh, if if you are have a wireless network and anybody can connect to a wireless network, excuse me, anybody can listen 
to a wireless network. Uh, when when a signal is transmitted through the air, it's actually been written in the law by the FCC that if something is being broadcast, you legitimately can listen to it. Um, there's nothing wrong with picking it up. There might be something wrong with trying to decrypt it and, and understand what's in there, but actually listening to what's being broadcast is perfectly legal. So if somebody's broadcasting something or transmitting something, I could listen to it and therefore eavesdrop. Uh, one of my favorites right here, uh, Evil Twin. Yeah, I've talked about this previously in another video uh, where maybe you go into a Starbucks and you see a, you try to connect your phone and you see a Starbucks Wi-Fi. In fact, maybe you see multiple Starbucks Wi-Fi's and you think, oh, well, one's on the west side of the building, one's on the east side, something like that. Uh, so you just go ahead and you connect up to the Starbucks Wi-Fi. Uh, one of those may be what's called an evil twin. Somebody may have just said, hey, there's a lot of people here at Starbucks. Uh, I want to see if I can capture their data. I want to see what they're actually transmitting. Maybe I can get some credit card information or, or something interesting here. So what they do is they set up an access point and access points don't all look like access points. So it could be most anything, uh, they, but they set up an access point and they name it Starbucks Wi-Fi. It is a twin of the legitimate Starbucks Wi-Fi. So it looks completely proper and correct. Uh, however, it's the evil twin that was set up by an attacker. Uh, let's see, denial of service. Because this is wireless, because we're just kind of sending messages out in the air, it's actually really easy to start doing a denial of service about that. Uh, I actually have a four year old right now and she has just kind of, she has just recently started learning that you can parrot back what people are saying. But if you parrot it back like half a second after they've said it, then suddenly the, the original speaker can't say anything. They can't finish their sentence because somebody's parroting back what they're saying and you can't follow along with what you're saying while somebody's saying what you, what was just there a couple of seconds ago and therefore it makes it impossible to have the conversation. So if my four-year-old can do that, then a hacker can essentially do the same thing except just send out garbage along the airwaves and cause an entire denial of service. Now this denial of service could be targeted against a specific user or against the entire wireless network, or in fact, all wireless networks in an area, uh, if they so choose. So, uh, since, uh, since security is all based around the CIA triad of confidentiality, uh, it, integrity and availability, a denial of service would affect the availability of the network and therefore cause a compromise of your security posture. Uh, and then lastly is what's called a wireless replay or reassociation attack. Uh, these are sp uh, specific types of attacks that are used by attackers. Uh, basically they eavesdrop to see what's happening on there and then possibly replay the messages that are already out there to either cause a denial of service or to cause them to cause the users to kick over to their evil twin. Uh, and then there's also an, a reassociation attack, which is again, eavesdropping in order to listen to how the computers associate with the access points, which helps them crack the weak encryption or the shared keys. There's a whole lot of specifics there you may not necessarily need to know at this point, uh, but let it be said that Wi-Fi has a lot of vulnerabilities. There's a lot of potential issues built into Wi-Fi, but there's a whole lot of benefits built into Wi-Fi as well, which is why we still use it. So how can we improve Wi-Fi? How can we help secure Wi-Fi in the future? Uh, first item on our list here is what's called Mac filtering. So every single device on your network, every single computer, every single network card has what's called a Mac address or a media access control address. And in theory, these are unique across the entire world. So you should never have two devices that have the same Mac address. In reality, that doesn't always happen. You can get conflicts out there 
just the, because of how it works and because of the scope of, of the number of network addresses out there. Uh, but in theory, uh, at least at the same time, you should never have the same MAC address in two different places. Uh, so what you could do is you could go into your wireless access point and you could filter based off of those. You could say, these are the MAC addresses I trust. These are my corporate devices. Only these corporate devices can access my network. Now, that's not the only way you should be securing your network because there are ways around it. Uh, I can actually change my MAC address. It's not that hard to do. Uh, so if I see that somebody's filtering based on Macs, I could start changing my MAC address in order to get back in. Uh, but it is one option. Uh, another option that people do, some people do, is to disable what's called the SSID broadcasts. Uh, basically, your wireless access point sends out a message that says, hey, I am Starbucks Wi-Fi. Uh, sends out a message saying, this is my channel. This is who I am. Uh, this is how you would want to connect to me. Some people will disable those SSID broadcasts, uh, and this is oftentimes called security by obscurity. There you go. Uh, by hiding the SSIDs, by, by hiding your network, it makes it a little bit more difficult for people to be able to connect to you. Now, it doesn't make them super difficult because by listening to other people that are talking to you, they could start figuring out exactly who you are. Uh, but it does make it a little bit more difficult for the general person, uh, general user, to be able to uh, try to connect to your pat to your network. Uh, WPA2 Enterprise and 802.1x authentication. So previously, when we talked about wireless networks, about how you connect to a wireless network, we used the term a shared key or a key, a password that was shared amongst all network devices in your organization. By using a combination of WPA2 and uh, WPA2 Enterprise and 802.1x authentication, this allows, instead of authenticating the device, it allows you to possibly to authenticate the user. So if you're using, say, Windows Active Directory, this allows you to authenticate the user via Active Directory to allow them in your network or not. Therefore, if you are concerned about people uh, accessing your network inappropriately or un unapproved devices accessing your network, what you could do is simply tell people to change their passwords. Once they've reset their passwords, uh, in theory, only the new devices that have the new passwords would be connected to your network. Uh, WPA2 Enterprise and 802.1x authentication can be used with user, user IDs. Uh, it can also be used with computer certificates. Uh, and that's not just an and uh, that's not just an or. Uh, it's not just user ID or certificates. Uh, it can be an and as well. So only specific users, only approved users, could access my network on approved devices, or any user on approved devices, or any device with approved users. Uh, so you can kind of mix and match this combination together. Uh, additionally, I mean, you could even take this even further to where you start checking if they have antivirus on their machine, uh, if they have uh, various security policies on their machine, such as the firewall. Um, you can actually take this to start improving the overall security, not just of your wireless network, but your entire network and your end user devices. Okay, uh, next one, rogue AP detection. So access points are really, really easy to set up in your network. Uh, so easy, the fa in fact, that you may actually have access points in your network that you didn't know about. Uh, I actually walked past a uh, police station not too long ago. Uh, I was coming back from a work event. Uh, at my hotel was just down the street, so I was heading down there and I walked past a police station and I saw in the window somebody had set up a Linksys access point. And I thought, oh, well, that's really curious. Uh, the fact that the access point was in the window and the curtains were closed suggested to me that somebody was trying to hide that so that they could have wireless in their office, but they didn't want like the IT person to see it. 
Um, but then it was right in front of the window, right by the door. So that means anybody who was outside the building would be able to access the environment as well. This would be called a rogue access point. And I've seen these myself in many different environments. Uh, I talked about the software I used previously where I found the user out in the parking lot. Uh, same thing, we, we had our, our defined access points and the software that we were using actually helped us identify a rogue access point. We actually found one that was like right there. And so we went, all, went over there and we're like shuffling through all the cubicles and we found it. It was hidden under somebody's desk. Uh, they said, oh, well, I can't connect to that one very well. Well, you know, tell us about it. You know, don't don't just try to circumvent it. Uh, tell us about it. We'll see what we could do to help you. Uh, but we we were able to take down the access point because I can secure this one. I can make that one as secure as I possibly want. If I don't even know about that one, that is probably unsecure. Yeah. There's no way to secure an access point I don't know about. So rogue AP detection uh, is helpful for that. There's a couple of different ways you could do that. Uh, like I said, my access points were actually intelligent enough to tell me where all these devices were in my environment. If yours isn't, uh, oftentimes you can get a, a device for a laptop that will help you identify. It's a very directional antenna, help you identify where it's seeing access points. Or you could even use a cell phone with, uh, with the right software on it, would be able to identify where it's finding access points. Uh, basically a uh, kind of like the, the kids game where you say hot, 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 getting cold, cold, cold. Uh, it's that kind of a game when you're using something like a smartphone or, or a laptop, uh, but it does actually get you in the, in the correct area. Uh, okay, uh, signal strength and antenna choices. So I talked about finding people out in our parking lot who were accessing our network. Well, we found out that we didn't necessarily need all of our antennas, all of our uh, access points to be running at 100% of, of power. Uh, having 100% power in all of our networks just made it that much easier for people out in the parking lot to be able to access to our networks. So we took our signal strength and we lowered it. We lowered our signal strength down to what was necessary for the coverage areas we were worried about, which was inside the building. Lowering the signal strength uh, stopped people from the parking lot from having access to our environment. And it also helped our overall uh, uh, processes or our overall performance of our Wi-Fi. Because our signals were, were smaller, it covered a smaller area, which then allowed users to connect to the closest access point in their area, uh, which meant that they weren't trying to go, you know, to the other side of the building and then out to the rest of the network. Uh, they were connecting to the local closest access point, uh, less people accessing it, and therefore it was overall faster. Uh, antenna choice, you don't always have a whole lot of choice with this, with some access points. Um, however, with some you do, you can choose, do I want uh, an antenna that, that kind of goes all around like that, or do I want an antenna that kind of goes in, in one direction more than the other. Uh, so you can, some access points, you can actually choose what type of antenna choices you want. Uh, captive portals, you've probably seen these if you've connected up to, uh, to an access point, say at Starbucks uh, or at a conference or some other public access point where it asks you to uh, accept the terms and conditions or to be able to log in or in some cases to pay. Captive portals can be used to, well, have people log in. Uh, so you can have access points in your environment that requires them to log in. Uh, again, utilizing WPA2 Enterprise and 802.1x authentication, the captive portal has them log in. Once they've logged in, they can now access the Wi-Fi. If they don't have correct username and passwords, then the captive portal says, ah, sorry, you can't get in. Or Possibly it puts them onto a slightly different network that gives them internet access, maybe limited internet access for, as a guest network, uh, but that's about it. Uh, and then lastly, channel selection. There, uh, For Wi-Fi, there's two main uh, Wi-Fi technologies that are being used today. Uh, there's 2.4 gigahertz, and then there's 5.1 gigahertz. 
I think it's 5.1, five something. Um, so you could choose which, which of those uh, ranges you want to work in. Do you want to work in 2.4 or in the 5? 2.4 is more, historically has been more common, more, more devices support it. Uh, however, because more devices support it, more people are using it, and therefore it's, all, it's much more crowded. Uh, additionally, 2.4 gigahertz is where microwaves live. Uh, I don't mean the microwaves like I talked about on the prior slide. I mean microwaves like heating up my popcorn. Uh, therefore, when the microwave goes on, all my network access goes down. Hmm. Uh, so going up to the 5 gigahertz can oftentimes help your uh, security just by having more availability to it. Additionally, inside of there, there are dozens of channels that you can choose from uh, to be able to say which, you know, I want to talk on this channel or I want to talk on that channel. Uh, the channel selection is very helpful. Uh, it helps make sure that you're not interfering with somebody else's or that somebody else's network isn't interfering with you, as well as helps you uh, organize your environment into multiple areas. Again, let's take the scenario of having a building with four access points. If I have each of these on different channels, then what's happening on channel one doesn't impact what's happening on channel two. So the, the devices don't necessarily start conflicting with each other. All right, so I hope that has been helpful. That's a brief overview of talking about wireless security. There is much, much, much more that you can get into here, uh, especially when you talk about specific types of attacks that might be happening out there and then how to overcome them. This is a ver uh, just a really nice introduction to the overall Wi-Fi security. I hope it has been helpful for you.